I want to take a minute and give you the background of this lesson. This was one of several lessons that we prepared for our trip to India, but we didn't give it in the form of a discourse. We gave it in the form of a study, which means we basically asked questions and uh, tried to involve as much um, audience participation as we could. However, we will spare you that method of delivery this morning. Uh, one of the problems with that is that we never ever finished the lesson. So, um, and hopefully we'll get to the end of the lesson today. We might give you an example of that when we have our trip report on our trip to India later. Ecclesia is a Greek word found in the New Testament and is typically translated in the English Bible as church. And we found with our uh, meetings with the Indian brethren, it is translated into the Tamil word church as well. It's Strong's number 1577, and it's actually a compound word, most of two words, ek, which means out, and a derivative of kalia, which means a calling. So it's a compound word that really means to be called out, especially of a religious congregation or of saints on earth, as Strong's, uh, Strong's translates it. And we find that ecclesia with decay appears 115 times in the New Testament. And we also find something very interesting. Jesus only used the word three times in his entire ministry. And the most important was when he asked Peter the question, who do you say that I am? Our Lord's response, on Peter, Peter responded, he said, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus responded to that statement in Matthew 16, 18. He says, upon this rock, this truth that he was the Messiah, I will build my church, my ecclesia, and the gates of Haiti will not overpower it. So the ecclesia is a called out class. Called out from what? Called out by God's truth from the masses of mankind, as the Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've been called out of the darkness, the confusion, the superstition, and the fake news of this present evil world, and we've been called to the light of God's truth. And the Apostle Paul adds something interesting in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. He says, God is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know, think about that statement. The light we received is the knowledge, not just the knowledge of God, not just the knowledge of God's mind, but the knowledge of the glory of God. And Jesus is the one who God has used to, to call us, to bring us to this light of the knowledge of the glory of his Father. Now, the Apostle Paul, in his defense before King Agrippa, he quoted Jesus' words to him regarding the mission that Jesus was going to give Paul for the rest of his earthly life. And these words are found in Acts, the 26th chapter, in verses 17 and 18, where Jesus told Paul, the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. You know, each one of us has been recipients of this call, of this call from darkness into God's light. You know, the scriptures, as we go through them, tell us a lot of different things about this call. For example, Paul in Ephesians 4.4 4 says that there is one body and one spirit, and also just as you were called in the one hope of your calling. At this time, there is just one call. As Paul says in the Philippians 3.14, is the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Or as Paul mentions in Hebrews 3, it is a whole heavenly calling 
we have been partakers of a heavenly calling. And Jesus is the high priest and the apostle of our profession. He is our leader. He's our teacher. He's our helper. He's our role model. And he is the one that has called us into this light. And he's called us, as Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 1.9, to holiness, to being holy as God is holy. The apostles Paul and John and Peter have lots to tell us about this calling. For example, Paul writes that we've been called to seek for glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life. We find that in Romans 2, 9, 2, 7, excuse me. More than that, we're called to be part of God's spiritual family. As the Apostle John writes in 1 John, the third chapter, in verses 1 and 2, he says, See how great the love the Father has bestowed upon us that we would be called children of God, and such as we are. Beloved, now are we the children of God. The call is to be children of God now, and if faithful, children of God forever. And we've been called to be part of that great antitypical Melchizedek priesthood that will bless the human family in Christ's kingdom, as the apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. He says, but we are a chosen race. We're going to have a spiritual reward. We've been called to a spiritual home, to a spiritual life. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. See the breadth of the call? Not only what we receive, but we can, what we do, which is to praise the excellency of our Heavenly Father. And we've been called to a work. We've been called to share with Christ in his work of lifting the human family out of the degradation of sin and that darkness that we were once mired in, and which we talked about in our study this morning. We will help Christ lift the human family out of that condition back to perfection and harmony with God to recover everything that Adam lost through his disobedience. You know, that's what the prophet Isaiah tells us in Isaiah, the 49th chapter in verses eight and nine. For thus says the Lord in a favorable time, I have answered you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you and will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people to restore the land, which is currently cursed, to make them to inherit the desolate heritages, the heritage that Adam lost by disobedience, saying to those who are bound, go forth, those in the prison house of death, and to those who are in darkness, show themselves, bring them out of that darkness and into that marvelous light. You know, the call has been, as the apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, to be servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. We have been called to become a faithful ministers of this new covenant that God will make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah to bless the entire human family. God has called us to be part of this work. And he's also called us to something else, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians seven fifteen. <laughs> He's called us to peace. He's called us to peace with himself. Not only peace with God, but peace of God. He's called us to bless us in this way. But he's also called us for something else. And that is to help bring mankind to the same level of peace with their heavenly father. Now that's the invitation. That's the call. But there are requirements that we must fulfill if we want to respond to this call or this invitation. We just don't automatically receive these blessings. You know, Jesus stated the requirements in Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 24 and 25. You know, then Jesus said to his disciples, he says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must do three things. He must deny himself. He must take up his cross. And he must follow me. 
And then Jesus adds something that really seems like an oxymoron. He says, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, we have to make a consecration to do those three requirements that Jesus mentioned to take advantage of this invitation. First, we must deny ourselves. We must deny our ambitions, our desires, our goals in life, and replace them that, with those that Jesus associates with this invitation. So deny ourselves is first. Second, we must take up our cross. In essence, we must agree to sacrifice our lives or to lose our life for Jesus' sake. And third, then we must follow Jesus wherever he leads us. We must follow him as our role model, follow him in, in his footsteps. The Apostle Paul uses similar language to describe how we should respond to this invitation in some verses that are very familiar with us, Romans 12, 1 and 2. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, I exhort you in the King James, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renovation of your mind, so you may prove what that will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. It is by our faith in the sacrifice of Jesus as a ransom for Father Adam and accepting him as our Savior. It's by doing that that we can then present ourselves as a sacrifice acceptable to God and thus accept this invitation, accept this calling. And that's what we do at consecration. And so the call is to sacrifice our fleshy lives, as Paul just said in Romans 12.1. But then the call also agrees, also is agreeing to a second work, to be transformed by the renovation of our minds, to be conformed to the image of God's dear son. And so the second aspect of that call is the work of sanctification, having our character transformed, just as Paul said in Romans 12, 2. And so there's this dual work of going on in our lives for us to accept this invitation, which is to sacrifice the flesh and to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And, and the apostle Paul brings this work to our attention in Ephesians the fourth chapter in verses 22 to 24. He says that in reference to the former manner of life, that we are to lay aside the old self, the fleshly life, the the life that we inherited as a member of a fallen human race, which Paul says is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. And that we are to be renewed in the spirit of our minds and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and the holiness of the truth. And so we lay aside the old man and the ways of the flesh and the, and the, the broad path that the whole human family is going down. And we embrace the narrow way and following in the footsteps of Jesus. You know, the Apostle Paul describes this change in a second place, in Colossians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 3. He says, therefore, if we've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things which are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind, set your heart on the things above, not on the things of the earth, for you have died. And your life is hidden with God, or with Christ in God. You know, the Apostle Paul describes this transformation in another place. In Romans, the eighth chapter and verse 29, with these words. He says, for those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. 
God predestined not individuals, but he predestined a class. You know, God's plan, if you go back to the Psalms in the 132nd Psalm, has always been to develop a divine family. And to accomplish this, God's plan has been to develop the ecclesia, the church, to be his son's bride, to become character copies of his dear son so they can be part of this divine family because that's an entrance requirement. To be part of God's divine family, you have to become like the son. You know, if, and so there is this work that progresses. We talked about it as the Reformation, Romans 12 too, but it's talking about the development of us into becoming copies of Christ. You know, and Paul goes into some detail explaining that in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 13. He says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. You know, Paul up here is telling us that we need to grow in two respects. Unity of faith, and we'll see why that is important in a minute. And then also in the knowledge of Jesus. And this growth in knowledge is for a very specific purpose, so that we might become mature Christians, that we might grow to fullness in Christ, to Christian maturity, or to become a character copy of our Lord. And there's a benefit of that. He says in verse 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by trickery of men, by craftiness of the skeetful scheming. No, Paul is telling us that we have to grow as a Christian. And if we don't, we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable to the deceptions and the distractions of the world and the adversary, and we won't finish our course with joy. And so it's critical that we grow. And then Paul goes on to comment in verses 15 and 16 of this fourth chapter of Ephesians to describe this growth. He says, by speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into him in all aspects, who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building of itself up in love. You know, it's interesting to know what Paul says in verse 16. You know, the body is held together, not just by what our Lord supplies, but what every joint, every part of the body supplies, according to the proper working of every part of the body. That tells us a very important truth that the growth of the body is dependent upon what we do as a member of that body. And so the body grows as the part grows, each part grows. And so we have a responsibility both individually and collectively, and we'll come back and talk about that in a minute. But to launch this growth, we must come to God and present ourselves in consecration to him by our faith in Jesus is our Redeemer. You know, this is what Jesus did when he came to Jordan to be baptized of John. Read in Matthew 3, beginning with verse 13, he says, and then Jesus arrived from Galilee at Jordan, coming to John to be baptized of him. Now remember at that point, John was baptizing the Jews for repentance of sins. But Jesus comes and says he wants to be baptized. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized of you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And so then John permitted and actually baptized him. You know, we do the exact same thing when we follow Paul's advice in Romans 12, 1, to present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, 
which is our spiritual service of worship. Romans 12.1 is fulfillment of what Jesus did at Jordan, presenting himself in consecration to do the Heavenly Father's will. But to become part of the ecclesia, the Christ, the body, God must accept our consecration. And this is what he did in the case of Jesus, as we read in Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. And after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him as a glove and lighting upon him. And behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God accepted Jesus' consecration. He begat him with the Holy Spirit, and Jesus became a new creature. Thus, Jesus became the Messiah, the Christ, because now he was anointed, as he expressed, at the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke 4, verses 18 through 21. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set it free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. For us to become part of the Christ, the ecclesia of God must accept our consecration and beget us with his Holy Spirit, just as he did with our Lord. You know, and this is what the Apostle Peter describes in 1 Peter, the first chapter in verses 3 and 4. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. If our consecration is accepted, then as Peter says later in the same chapter, verse 23, we have been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, not from a fallen father, but incorruptible through the word of God, which liveth and abideth. And this begetting makes us an embryo new creature as the Apostle Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, new things have come. You know, Jesus supports this thought that we must become a new creature to be associated with him as a member of his body and ultimately with him in heaven. Remember what he said to Nicodemus? John 3.3, 3, he said, Truly, truly, I say unto thee, except one be begotten from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know, this begetting comes from above. From God, when he accepts our consecration, when he begins that new creature in us through his Holy Spirit. You know, as, as the Apostle Paul calls this new creature, he calls it the new self in Colossians 3 and verse 10. And he tells us to put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. It's God who creates this new mind in us through his Holy Spirit. And through that new mind and the enlightening power of the Holy Spirit, we get a true knowledge of God, of the glory of God, of his plans and his purposes. You know, those so begotten, as Paul writes, and we've already quoted in Ephesians 4, 24, we are to put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. We've been begotten again, not by corruptible seed, but by the Holy Spirit. And as a new creature, this new self is to grow into the likeness of Jesus, as we've mentioned before, and which Paul mentions not just in Ephesians, but also in Colossians, beginning with verse 12. And so he says, Colossians 3, beginning with verse 12, so also those who have been chosen of God, 
holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. You know, at a watch night service just a few nights ago, Brother Bob reviewed these verses in detail and the importance, the critical importance of developing these characteristics in the process of being conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus. And notice very, inter something very interesting in verse 12. Those who've been begotten by God's Holy Spirit are the chosen. They have been chosen by God through that begettal. The spirit that they have received identifies them as part of the ecclesia, part of the Christ, and it's a pledge of their future spiritual inheritance they will receive if they fully grow into Christ's likeness. You know, it's as Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians, the first chapter in verses 13 and 14. He says, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is, who is given or which is given as a pledge of our inheritance. In 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the Apostle Paul compares Christ to the human body, and he describes it in these terms. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is the Christ. He's saying that the Christ, the body of Christ, the ecclesia, is ultimately composed of many members. And we learn in the book of Revelation, it's 144,000. Paul goes on and says, For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free. We're all made to drink of one spirit, the same spirit, God's Holy Spirit. You know, being begotten by God's Holy Spirit, that's what makes us a member of the body. And it really doesn't matter what our fleshly background came from. Because that's not how God is looking at us at that point any longer. For, as Paul says, the body is not one member, but many. He continues in verse 15. He says, if that foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. You know, if we're begotten by God's Holy Spirit, we're part of the body, regardless of what party we are, regardless of where we came from. Verse 16, and if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. For if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? The human body has a variety of different parts and systems. And while they're all different, they're all part of the same body. And it's their cooperative functioning that enables the body to live and to be productive. You know, it's like Paul says in verse 18, he says, but now God has placed the members, every one of them in the body, just as he desired. You know, through spirit begettal, God has set each member of the body just where he wants it. He selects our brother. We don't select them. God does through spirit begettal. Paul continues to describe this oneness of the body in verse 19. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again to the head, the feet, I have no need of you. You know, in Paul's day, the members of the Ecclesia came from many different backgrounds. Some were Jews, others were Gentiles. A few were free men, but there were also slaves. There were men and women. 
Think about the differences between these groups. But once they were begotten by the Holy Spirit, those distinctions made no difference in God's sight. They were all one in Christ Jesus, as Paul writes in Galatians 3.28. For there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor free will, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You know, in the ecclesia, those earthly distinctions mean nothing. Now, because the body is many parts, unity in the body is really very important. You know, Paul continues in verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 12. He says, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members have the same care one for another. Now, the Corinthian brethren struggled to accept this concept. You know, they had divided into sects according to earthly differences. And Paul, in his first epistle, reprimands them for these divisions, saying that was an evidence of their lack of spiritual growth, that they were still infants in Christ. He says in chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as men of flesh as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it yet. Indeed, even now you are not able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? For when, when, for when one says, I'm of Paul, and another says, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? You know, Paul was talking to the Corinthians, but he was also talking to us. He's telling us when we divide into groups and we shun those that are in a different group, that's wrong. That's fleshly. You know, if we're doing that, we're still infants in Jesus. We're, we're not mature Christians. There's no divisions in the body in heaven. There should be no divisions here in the flesh. You know, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4, going back to there, explains why we have a body despite its many parts, is viewed by God as one unit. He said, beginning in verse 4, he says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called in the one hope of your calling. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. There's just one body. because. There is just one spirit, God's Holy Spirit, that we've been, that, that when we received it, has baptized us into that body. There's one hope, the hope of the high calling. There's one faith, faith in our Lord Jesus as a ransom for Adam. One baptism into Jesus' death. And there's one God who has planned and orchestrated this all. That's why there's one body because of all of the ones that have come before that have led us into this organization. You know, now through the Apostle Paul's epistle, God has used the human body to picture the church, the ecclesia on this side of the veil. And, and why was that illustration used? You know, the cooperative functioning of all of the systems of the body is truly amazing. And I think really demonstrates to us how the body of Christ is to operate. You know, we have a graphic on the screen. It shows six of the major systems of the body. And think about the specific work each system does, and yet it cooperates with the other systems to maintain life in this, in this organization of maybe a trillion cells. You know, the circulation system pumps the blood and the nutrients to all parts of the body. It doesn't function, the body dies. The nervous system controls all the body systems from the head, controls movement, controls automatic and voluntary processes. If the nervous system isn't work, the hand doesn't move. You don't walk. The, the respiratory system provides oxygen to all the cells of the body to live and takes away the carbon dioxide. The digestive system takes the food we eat, breaks it down into the chemicals that our body, that our cells can actually use. Skeletal system, it's the frame 
to which the whole, all the body parts are attached. And the muscular system holds the body parts to the skeleton and helps the whole body move. Any of those things break down and the body eventually dies. You know, this illustration really gives us a sense of both the unity and the diversity of the body. And the fact that God would place the members of the body in any role as it pleases him. So what does the organization of the human body tell us about the ecclesia? Well, first of all, there's one head. And we are to take the direction from the head. You know, this means that we're to follow Jesus' instructions, his commandments, and his example to us. He is our role model. He is the high priest. Remember we quoted, he's the high priest of our profession. Second of us, each one of us has a role to play in the ecclesia. We cannot say there's nothing for us to do in the body because that's simply not true. We have a role to play, whatever it might be. But not everyone's role is the same. But God has put us in the role, in the body, as it pleased him. Some roles have more honor. Others have less honors. But everybody has a role. And overall, the role of the body is to prepare itself for works of service. And now that is helping one another grow into the likeness of Christ. And in the future, it will be part of that great Melchizedek priesthood that will bless all the families of the earth. You know, the Ecclesia has one head. Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, 23, that Christ is the head of the body. Or he said of the church, the Ecclesia, he himself being savior of the body. And this is an arrangement that God has set up. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And God has put all things in subjection under her feet and given him to be head over all things to the Ecclesia, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. God has given Christ to us, is our head, and given us to him as his body, to be his bride. You know, that means we're to follow the directions of the head and thus emulate our Lord. But to be faithful parts of Christ's body means we got to give up our own heads. And that's what the Apostle John describes in Revelation, the 20th chapter in verse 4, where he describes those who've made their calling and election sure. He says, I saw the souls of them who had been beheaded because of the witness, the testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Only those who are beheaded for Christ win the crown of life. But how does the body grow into Christ? Apostle Peter gives us some more specifics about this, beginning in 2 Peter 1, verses 5. He says, now for this reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence and your moral excellence knowledge. You know, our growth as a copy of Christ begins with our faith, our faith which led us to the point of consecration but it doesn't stop there. So there we have to add moral excellence and then we have to add knowledge. Knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. You know, notice how each development of each step leads to the next step of our development in the likeness of Christ. And in your knowledge, we add self-control and self-control perseverance and in perseverance, godliness. You know, the knowledge of God helps us to self-control. And that leads to cheerful endurance in the face of trials. And that in turn leads to, to piety, godliness, reverence to God. And then in your godliness, we go, we grow to brotherly kindness and ultimately to agape or divine love. You know, it's interesting that reverence for God leads to brotherly kindness for our brethren who are called by the same invitation that we've received, and ultimately then to the pinnacle of the Christian character, or agape love. Now notice something really interesting. Reverence to God comes before brotherly love. Why do you think the characteristics are organized that way? 
because it is reverence for God that allows us to accept our brethren as fellow members of the body because they're God's choice, not our choice. And if these qualities are yours and increasing, they render you neither useless nor fruit, unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so, as we begin this new year, 2020, we pose a question. What must we do individually and collectively? as members of the Ecclesia, to help the body grow and to help us grow individually as members of that body and to help our brethren grow into Christ because the goal is to have the body completed. You know, we like the way David expressed this to his son Solomon in First Chronicles twenty two nineteen. He says, now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise, therefore, and build the sanctuary, build the temple, Build the ecclesia of the Lord God. Now, we mentioned before that to be part of this body, there's individual responsibilities and there's collective responsibilities. And so what are those responsibilities in the year ahead? Well, individually, we should set our affections on things above. We should let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, and we should become doers of the word and not just hearers. Collectively, we must follow our Lord's new commandment to love one another. We must build up one another in the faith, and we must lay down our lives for the brother. You know, to be successful in anything, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to put our heart into it. And Jesus expressed this idea with regard to serving him in Matthew 6, He says, but seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. And Paul says this focus should be in our life. He confirmed by saying in Colossians 3, 1 and 2, therefore, if we've been raised up with Christ, if we've been spirit begotten, keep seeking the things that are above. Set our mind, our heart on things above, not on the things of the earth. You know, that's what Jesus did. Remember, concerning him, he delighted to do God's will because God's law was within his heart. And we must have that same perspective if we're going to be successful in becoming a member of the body beyond the veil. Secondly, we must take the word of Christ into our hearts and minds so we can be guided by it. Apostle James writes in James 1.21, he says, putting away all the things that are associated with the flesh, he says, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. You know, if we receive that word into our hearts and minds, it will save us. Paul said in Ephesians 1.13, he says, After listening to the message of truth, the gospel of his salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. You know, it's not enough just to receive the word. It's not even enough just to study the word. We must believe it. We must act upon it. And as the Apostle Paul said, and Brother Bob quoted last Tuesday night, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts. And third, we must become doers of the word. It's not enough to hear the word. It's not enough even just to believe the word. We have to put it into practice, as James tells us in James 1, beginning with verse 22. He says, but prove yourselves to be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. You know, we have to do more than study. We have to do more than know the truth. We must become doers of the truth. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it. Not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in what he does. As Jesus said in John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, 
you will abide in my love, just uh, kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. But we have not just individual responsibilities, we have collective responsibilities as well. We have the collective responsibility of following Jesus' new commandment, which he gave us in John 13, 34, and 35. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. You know, agape love for our brethren is a symbol, is a sign really of spirit begettled. It's a sign that we're a disciple of Christ. It is a sign that we love Jesus because we are keeping his new commandment. You know, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, he says, now, as to love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write for you because you yourselves are taught of God to love, agape, one another. You know, we're taught to love one another and our love shows our reverence for God. Remember? Godliness, filial love, agape love. As the Apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter 1.22, so that you in obedience to the truth have purified your souls or your lives for a sincere filial love for the brethren. He says, don't stop there. Go on, fervently love, fervently agapeo one another. From the heart. It is by love, this love, that we serve one another. And that love to brethren, what does it lead? It leads to service, as Paul just mentioned. Romans 15, 1 and 2. For we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. And not just to please ourselves, we are to please his neighbor for his good, for his edification. And the word here, neighbor, just doesn't mean our person living next door to us. It's talking about our fellows. It's talking about our brethren. We are to do them good for their building up in the ecclesia. We are to pursue the things that make for peace and the building up, the edification of one another. As he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, we are to encourage one another and build other, one another up just as we are doing. And, and we have been building one another up, but there's more work to do in 2020. And finally, our love for our brethren, our desire to bring them, build them up as members of the Ecclesia should lead us to lay down our lives for them just as Jesus did. Remember what John said in 1 John 3, 16 through 18? He says, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And that love is to be not just in word, but in deed and in truth. And you know, if we look for examples on people who laid down their life for the brethren, we have Jesus as the prime example, but we also have the Apostle Paul, who demonstrated his love by action, by laying down his life for the brethren, through a life of a lifelong of service to the brethren. You know, as he said in 1 Thessalonians 2, 8, he says, having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel, but our own lives, because you have become very dear to us. You know, likewise, our brethren should become very dear to us, and we should lay down our lives for them. So in conclusion, the Ecclesia is a called out class. It's called to a high, a high, a heavenly, a holy calling, to be sons of God, to be conformed to the image of God's dear son, to sacrifice their flesh, be sanctified in the spirit. They're one body, but with many members. And God has put the members in the body where it pleased him. There are to be no divisions in the body. Christ is our head. We are to grow up into our head and we are to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. For 20 to 21, excuse me, for 2020, individually we must set our affections on things above. We must let the word of Christ dwell in us richly 
and become effectual doers of the word, not just hearers, doers. Collectively, we are to follow that new commandment to love one another, to build one another up in the faith and to lay down our lives for the brethren. May the Lord help us to do all of those things, to become more faithful members of the ecclesia in the year ahead. Because if faithful, they will be our future family. May the Lord add his blessing.